Guys, I'm here to talk to you about something extremely, extremely important. Um, recently, AVSAB, the American Veterinary Society of Animal Behavior, has put forth a statement, um, position statement on humane dog training. I'm going to put a link to it down below so you can read it, um, examine it. I was mentioned by a couple of people who were on, online. Uh, Beckman mentioned me. Um, Zach George kind of brought this out. Um, I kind of respect him for the way he approached this. I thought it was very good. So I want to touch on it and I want to give it a different skew, a different angle that nobody's had on it before. So stay tuned because it's going gonna, it's gonna to get good. I'm going to start out by reading the conclusion of AV, AVSAB's overall statement. And I want to emphasize on a couple of words. The conclusion is based on current scientific evidence, AVSAB recommends that only reward-based training methods are used for all dog training. I'm going to repeat that. Only reward-based training methods are used for all dog training, including the treatment of behavior problems. We're going to get into that. Aversive training methods, AVSAB says, have a damaging effect on both animal welfare and the human-animal bond. They continue, there is no evidence, no evidence, none, no evidence that aversive methods are more effective than reward-based methods in any context. This is their statement, right? Now, the important thing to remember here is something that I've always looked at in the Bible, Proverbs 18, 17, which says the one who states his case first seems right until the cross-examination begins. And let's get started, shall we? For those of you who might not know me, I have spent over a decade in dog training, 12, 13 plus years. Um, I've trained competitive obedience dogs, I've trained pets, I've trained protection dogs, I've um, competed with my dogs. But the heart and soul of what I really believe in, what, what got me started and what continues my passion for dogs are those that are forgotten those that are neglected, those that are given up on, those that are sometimes too difficult to train, to handle, that they end up in our shelters. And oftentimes these dogs are killed. They live on concrete and they're killed on a metal table and put in barrels because no one loved them. Those people who had them gave up on them and there wasn't a positive only trainer that could come along and fix their issues. That is the heart and soul of what I've done. I've spent countless hundreds of hours handling hundreds and thousands of dogs with everything from mild to extremely severe behavior problems, including human aggression, dog to dog aggression, fear, confusion, obsessive behaviors, and anything else that you might think about. For 12 years, I've worked with the Los Angeles City Shelter System as a nonprofit, not as an employee, as a nonprofit, as an independent person. In those 12 years, I have never had a serious bite on me. I have never had a serious bite or incident from one dog to another. And there's been times we've had 10, 15 plus pit bulls Staffies, Mastiffs, Mastiffs, Shepherds, any breed you can imagine in a yard playing. We've done behavior modification on these dogs. We've done um, increased adoptions on these dogs because of the approach I used, which was what we call a balanced training approach. It's not positive only. It's not compulsion. It's in the middle. It always starts with a cookie and a toy, and where it goes from there, that's up to the dog. This methodology, this single-handed idea that I started with when I loved my Sharpay so much that I said that I would help other dogs, this ideal and this idea has saved thousands of dogs, not only in Los Angeles, but throughout the world. People have watched the videos, have come in to take my course. Based on my experience with these dogs, not my competitive dogs, not my purebred Malinois, German Shepherd, Labrador, or anything, but with the dogs that other people gave up on, with the dogs 
in the shelter that didn't get to see the positive only trainer come into the shelter with a cookie and a clicker. With these dogs, I cut my teeth and I taught these people who worked with them and helped these dogs to learn skills to save their lives. And yes, there was aversives involved. There was corrections involved. Now, that being said, in the shelter, because of animal rights ideologies, I was not allowed to use an e-collar. I was not allowed to use a prong collar. I had demonstrated it, but it was not a tool that would be allowed to be used because of animal rights advocates. These were people who did not necessarily love animals, but they loved their agenda. And that's what we're dealing with here is an agenda, an agenda to shut down balanced training, an agenda to take away your rights as a dog owner, as a dog trainer, and as a dog advocate. A person who loves a dog will give the dog the tools that dog needs to succeed, to stay alive, and to have a balanced life in society. So one part of this, and I'm going to take it apart piece by piece here, Avsab says, research supports the efficacy of reward-based training to address unwanted and challenging behaviors. No, it doesn't. That is a lie. There is no evidence that aversive training is necessary for dog training or behavior modification. And that is the bigger part of the lie. Because if there is no evidence that aversive training is necessary for dog training or behavior modification, then that would prove that positive-only training is able to solve those problems. And if positive-only training was able to solve those problems, we wouldn't need corrective-based training. Because most training that comes to uh, balanced trainers, of people who might use an aversive like a prong collar or a choke chain or something like that, most people, most dog owners, will start with a positive-only approach. They'll start with a cookie. They'll start with a treat. But when that doesn't work, they will escalate up the ladder to see what will work, what will help their dog to understand what they need the dog to understand. And that is when the balanced training comes in. We don't start with it. We use it as a next level. Any trainer online will tell you this. Any trainer you can watch on, on YouTube who's a balanced trainer will tell you, you start luring and shaping behaviors early on. Then you will use an aversive to reinforce it for disobedience. If I tell my dog to come and my dog doesn't come, I need a negative to make the dog come. I need something aversive. I need a consequence to not make the dog come. I'll continue. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I've got little highlights here. I use my little highlighter to highlight things. They continue, it is understood that animals are sentient and should be treated with respect and compassion. Let me tell you something about compassion and respect for animals. For a dog to end up in a shelter, to live on a concrete floor, walk through his own feces and urine, to be spinning around in that kennel, screaming and howling, and being isolated or put in a kennel with another dog that they don't know that they're fearful of is one of the most traumatic things you can do to a sentient being. It is one of the cruelest things when a family abandons a dog at the front door of a shelter and that dog is walked into the back by a shelter employee, put in a cage that he's never seen before to never see once again his family that he loved. If we're talking about sentient beings, Avsab, and positive-only people, we need to talk about the compassion we show to these sentient beings and locking them up in a kennel with a steel door, cold, wet floors, hot, sticky nights is not compassion. If a pop on an e-collar, on a prong collar, or a choke chain can solve that problem and that dog should never end up there, how compassionate are we for not giving that a try? Honestly, I continue. 
Training methods are most effective when they focus on teaching the animal what to do rather than punishing them for unwanted behaviors. I agree with part of this more than anything else. Because if we can reward a dog for doing what we want him to do, the dog will learn that behavior. I've proven that in my competitive obedience dogs. I've titled my dogs by using positive methods. But when a dog is exhibiting a negative behavior, an unwanted behavior, chasing a rabbit, how do we reward that without a consequence? But by interjecting a consequence, by putting an aversive in there and stopping the behavior at our discretion, not at the dog's choice, we therefore give the dog the ability to gain the reward faster and to stop the unwanted behavior. Here's a great challenge. If we were only going to use some positive methodology and we had a dog that, let's say hypothetically, is reactive to another dog, and I understand the, the, the positive only approach, okay, and no fault to positive trainers, because I'll tell you, I, I saw Zach say something that's pretty in, interesting that he has taken certain dogs and done very well with them, but he may have done better without it. He's not claiming, and a lot of positive only trainers, those of you who don't claim to solve severe aggression or severe behavior problems, kudos to you. You're doing a great job. You're helping dogs learn skills at the level that you're getting them at. You're not stepping outside of your box and going to these behaviors because these are the behaviors of the dogs that will be killed if this garbage passes. If you as a positive only trainer or a person from AVSAB has a dog that you love, will you take that dog you love, put him in a yard with a dog that has severe aggression and try to counter that aggression on that dog with your dog in the, the other dog's presence? Will you do that using your positive only training? And what will you do? What will you do when that aggressive dog goes after your dog? Just tell me. That's what I'd like to know. Because I can show you video footage of me putting my prized Goofy and Jimmy in front of an aggressive dog, working that aggressive dog in a very fair way, and showing the results almost instantly. More serious behavior concerns, such as aggression, here we go, anxiety and fear. First of all, aggression and anxiety and fear are very, very different. Require a treatment plan. So now we're looking at a plan, and we're, I'm all for plans. I love plans. And this includes environmental management. You know what that means? Don't take them in the environment where there's another dog. Behavior modification, and in some cases, medication. Now, medication is where we got to draw some lines. Medication is very important. I believe in medication. I believe in Eastern and Western medication. I, I have no issue with it at all. In fact, there's been dogs that I recommended should go on to medication. There is no medication, no medication in the world that deals with aggression. It can deal with fear. It can deal with neuroses. It can deal with a lot of things. But show me a medicine that has that is a treatment for aggression. I'd like to see it. There is none. But as we keep doping up these dogs and giving them more and more antidepressants or, or, uh, or anxiety medicine, stuff like that, look what happens to people who are on antidepressants for extended periods of time. They end up committing suicide, killing other people, and such. We're only going to make the behaviors worse by trying to put a drug on top of it. Management can include avoiding situations. So if you have a dog that's slightly reactive, and I'm not even saying aggressive, but slightly reactive to other dogs, you just shouldn't bring it around other dogs. And you know what that does? It reinforces the behavior of the dog being reactive. Because gradual exposure, good exposure, corrected exposure, showing the dog the behavior we want through corrections and rewards, will teach the dog what the dog should do to get back into that environment by taking him completely away, which is what we've seen now from COVID,
by not exposing dogs, by not socializing dogs, their behavior has gotten worse. And by removing them from this, by not letting them around it, you're going to make it worse. Um, many methods of changing behavior in dogs are effective. I, I agree. I would wholeheartedly agree. Many are effective, but you're trying to eliminate half of them. However, the evidence-based veterinarian or behavior consultant should be concerned not just with what is effective, but what does the least harm and produces the longest-term results? I kind of agree, but I kind of disagree. What we should be concerned with is what gets the results we want in the most efficient manner possible and protect the other dogs. You can't expose one dog, a neutral dog, to an aggressive dog without you willing to stop the aggressive behavior from that dog. It's imperative. Now, they go on to say detrimental effects. The detrimental effects on animal welfare, the acute effects, and I'm only going to touch on the acute ones, says in observational studies, dogs trained with aversive methods or tools showed stress-related behaviors during training. Now, stress is not necessarily a bad thing. You got to remember that, right? If I go to the gym and I work out and I'm dieting and working out and, and getting fit, I'm putting stress onto my body. In other words, I'm putting stress onto my heart to make my heart stronger. That's imperative. It's easier to sit back and drink a six pack of beer, which puts no stress on me, but long term it degrades my health, as opposed to going to a gym and squatting six to 10 sets at 6 a.m. in the morning, which puts a stress on my heart, but makes it stronger. So stress added can be a positive. Okay, so dogs trained with diverse methods or tools showed stress-related behaviors during training, including tense body, lower uh, body posture, lip licking, tail lowering, lifting front leg, panting, yawning, and yelping. Now, these are observational things that they were talking about. And the important thing to think about is if those things were present, if they were, observationally, and it led to a better result at the end, if a dog has a brazen attitude, is aggressive, is dominant, and we take those away, and the dog is showing some of these stress stressors, then the dog learns the lesson, then the lesson is learned, and we solve the problem. Again, I'm going to go back to something. The other option is to use a positive-only methodology to take away all tools, take away the prong collars, the e-collars, the, the choke chains, eventually crates, eventually slip leads, eventually everything, which is going on in Europe now. And those of you, my friends who are in Europe, you know what I'm talking about. Sweden, Finland, Norway, Germany, Switzerland, Wales, you all know what's going on. You know your shelters are filling up because the behavior problems are not being solved. Your purebred, beautiful dogs that come from great lines have a really easy time. And in these homogenous societies, Denmark, Netherlands, all these countries, there isn't this overabundance of mixed breed dogs, of pit bull mixes, of shepherd mixes, of mastiff mixes, of very dominant breed mixes that we have here in the States that we have to deal with. Those are the dogs that are filling up our shelters. You show me your little labradoodles and your beautiful golden retrievers and your golden doodles, and you show me how your training works on those dogs, and I applaud you. I think it's fantastic. But take out that 100-pound Mastiff. Take out that 80-pound Pit Bull that's, that, that's capable of ripping somebody to shreds. Take out that 70-pound Malinois, that German Shepherd, the ones you're not going to touch, and tell me how you're going to solve that problem. Because you're not. You're going to write articles. You're going to put forth ideals, ideals that are un- passable. They will not work. You'll take your positive attitude and you'll discard so many animals that could potentially have a really beautiful life with a little bit of structure, with a little bit of training, with a little bit of discomfort. After all, 
It's through discomfort that we grow. It's through stress that build better and stronger character. If you think the stress of an e-collar or a prong collar or a choke chain is too much, and instead you take away that option from people like me, people who are balanced trainers, you take away that option and you make the only other option euthanasia, then you, my friends, are responsible for killing thousands and thousands of dogs and adding more and more dogs to an already overcrowded, overrun, mismanaged, sheltering system that we see today. One thing that so many of these studies and so many of these positive-only advocates constantly talk about is the abuse of things like e-collars and prong collars and choke chains. And I would agree with you 100%. In fact, I'm for punishing the people who abuse those tools. I'm all for punishing people who abuse animals. Let me get my hands on them. I'd be more than happy to punish them. But what you're not getting is the benefits that can be derived from the proper use of a tool. It's not the tool that's bad. It's the abusive person handling it. I'll tell you right now, I've seen people who went from balanced training to a positive approach. And when their dog didn't do what they wanted it to do, they didn't have a prong collar or an e-collar to give it a correction. You know what they did? They kicked it. They kicked it and they yelled at it. And studies have shown that one of the greatest stressors you can put on a dog is yelling at them. Emotional abuse outweighs physical abuse every single time. Every single time. And if you're going to say that taking away a prong collar or an e-collar is going to make abuse go away, man, you're naive. In fact, you're downright stupid. Because once you remove one tool, another tool's coming right in. And whether that's using the end of a leash to, to beat a dog with, to whip a dog with, a foot to kick a dog with, a fist to punch a dog with, it's all there. Abuse is abuse, and abuse should be punished. Abuse must be punished. Anyone will tell you that. I'm all for punishment, strict, strict punishment, but not by limiting a tool, but by limiting the idea of punishment, of abuse. I know this video is going to be seen by people all over the world, all over the world, but I want to harness an important value to me, and that is the freedom of America. In the United States, we have freedom of choice. We have freedom of religion, freedom of sexual choice, freedom of pol political choice, freedom of choice of what we want to eat, what we want to wear, what kind of music we want to listen to, what we believe in and what we don't believe in. It is what made America great. So many of the things you see in dog training were developed and harnessed and, and, and brought forth through great ingenuity and through great freedoms. By taking away a choice, a choice of a decision to use a prong collar, an e-collar, or a cookie, or a leash, or a slip lead, or a crate, or anything, once you undermine that freedom, once you remove the ability to make those choices, you are, you're, you're destroying what makes dog training great. No one on the balanced training side is ever saying to positive only people, don't do that. Don't use cookies. Don't use a clicker. A clicker is an aversive, to, is a negative thing to a dog. It's never, never the balanced trainer that will go to the positive-only trainer and tell them how to train the dog. It is constantly the positive people who come along through their own insecurity and tell us how we should be training dogs. Yet, when confronted with a challenge, which I've seen the challenge that's going on in England now, as well as the challenge that I had for 12 years, and in those 12 years, it was never, never... Uh, approached. No one ever came to a shelter. No positive trainer ever came to one of my workshops, never, and showed me a better way to do it. 
I had the challenge available for years, but not one person ever stepped up and said, Robert, I want to pick the dog for you, and I want you to pick the dog for me. I'll use my positive only, and you use your balanced approach. Never happened. Another point on the AVSAB um, conclusion or decision or whatever they're calling it, a, posi a statement, a position statement, says, and this is one of the most critical, it says recall training is the most common reason dog owners use remote electronic collars. Even in the hands of experienced trainers, no difference in the effectiveness was found between remote electronic shock collars versus reward-based methods for teaching, recall, or stop. And they're right. Except for when you introduce the distraction. A dog is a predatory animal. It's a predator. When the prey drive of the predator kicks in, there is no way, in, there is no way, and I would challenge anyone to show me the way, to counter the prey drive without overriding it with a negative consequence. I'm going to give you an example. A dog is in a field. A dog was trained positive only. That means every time the dog came to me, it received a cookie, it received a ball, it received some praise. Every time. Then I put it in the field and I call the dog. And a deer runs by. Dog has never seen a deer. What do you think the dog will do? I'm not talking about a golden doodle. I'm talking about a dog with a high degree of prey drive. A Malinois, a German Shepherd, a Mastiff, a Pit Bull, a Terrier. What will that dog do? And I can tell you honestly, I've talked to friends of mine who have told me, and these are professional trainers that when that predatory drive kicks in you're not getting that dog back if you cannot override the predatory drive of the dog with a negative consequence a negative stimulus you will not stop that behavior with a cookie because the dog's innate drive his predatory drive for the prey will override his desire for a cookie, a treat, or anything. The negative implication on top of that will not only save that dog's life, it will save the life of livestock, possibly another dog it might be chasing, and also the heartbreak of the family who has to be told that their dog chased a deer into the road and got hit by a car. I spent the last 12 years of my life training dogs, loving dogs, competing with dogs, living with dogs. Dogs have absolutely changed my life. No one can tell you that I don't love dogs as much as I love my life. If I couldn't have dogs, I wouldn't want to live. Like Roy Rogers said, if there's no dogs in heaven, send me where the dogs are. But the dogs I focused on through most of those years and through most of my passion were the dogs in the shelters, the dogs everyone gave up on. And there is nothing I love more than luring and shaping and rewarding behaviors. Getting that sit, the down, the come, the shake paw, the whatever you want with the use of a cookie or a toy. There's nothing I love more than that. But when I'm faced with the challenge of a dog that is aggressive, that is reactive, that is non-compliant, I love dogs. There's nothing I love more than our dogs. Training dogs, living with our dogs, engaging with our dogs, and most importantly, helping others with their dogs. Over the last 12 years, I've spent so much of my time with dogs living and dying in shelters. If everything could be solved with a cookie and a toy, I would embrace that approach 100%. In fact, I start every single interaction with a dog with a positive, with a treat, 
with a toy. Every interaction. Luring a shape, luring a sit, luring a behavior, shaping positive behaviors. There is nothing more rewarding than that. But taking away a tool or a set of tools that can benefit dogs that would otherwise not be able to learn a behavior, that would otherwise possibly end up being given up on, being put in a shelter and put to death because our tools are limited, that is not an option. That is not something I will stand for. That is something that I will fight for. I will fight against any organization and any person who tries to limit a dog trainer's ability to help every dog. It is our job, it is our responsibility to save and train every dog we can. Not to give up on dogs because tools aren't available or because potentially a tool could be abusive. If a tool is abusive, it is abusive only by the hand which uses it. Not the tool, but the hand and the decision that is made by the person. It's time to punish the people who abuse animals and not take away the tools that can help the animal. I thank you for listening. I thank you for subscribing to my channel. And I thank you for loving dogs. God bless all of you and thank you. <laughs>